Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the NED. My name is Janelle Nottrip Williams, and I'm a program officer for the Latin America and Caribbean team here at the National Endowment for Democracy. On behalf of the NED and the Latin America program in particular, I am very pleased to welcome you to today's event on corruption in Central America. As we're well aware, corruption is a global phenomenon, but its regional manifestations and implications have varied across regions and take different forms. In recent years in Central America, high-profile corruption cases have played out on a macroeconomic level, undermining confidence in public institutions, eroding the rule of law, and posing serious challenges to effective governance and the provision of goods and services. It's really important to note that beyond the attention-grabbing nature of many of these individual cases and so-called scandals, there are levels of aggregate corruption in the Northern Triangle countries of Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador that are widespread and reflect very systemic corruption. It's one of the major challenges to democratic consolidation in these countries with weak institutions, which makes it even more difficult to combat. Now is a critical moment to be taking a deep dive into the issue. Corruption cases are making headlines once again in recent weeks and even days in Central America. We've seen a resurgence in public protests recently, particularly in Guatemala, the largest since 2015. And special commissions and institutions working to root out impunity and corruption are facing a new wave of concerning backlash. We have two distinguished guests here with us today to discuss the issue. Ricardo Barrientos is a senior economist from the Central American Institute for Fiscal Studies, or ISAFI. Previously, Ricardo served as Guatemala's Vice Minister of Public Finance in charge of fiscal transparency. ISAFI is a leading think tank dedicated to the research and analysis of fiscal governance and public policy, and also a valued NED partner, I might add. They've just released a new book entitled Corruption, Its Pathways, Social Costs, and an agenda for combating it. It's a comparative study uh, of the relationship between corruption and democracy in the Northern Triangle countries. But what's really noteworthy is how ISEFI's analysis moves beyond many of the already well understood generalities regarding corruption and highlights main pathways of corruption within each state, measures social costs of corruption, and most importantly, I think, offers a specific agenda of priority objectives to begin to combat it. Ricardo will share some of the main findings of the book with us to be followed by commentary from Juan Pablo Guerrero. Juan Pablo is the network director of the Global Initiative for Fiscal Transparency, a multi-stakeholder action network to advance fiscal transparency, public participation, and accountability in countries around the world. He was a founding commissioner of the Federal Institute for Access to Information and Data Protection in Mexico and has served as the manager of the Mentoring Governments for Transparency program at the International Budget Partnership. I would refer you to their complete bios for more details on their many accomplishments. I'd like to turn the floor over to them quickly. So for those of you on Twitter, you can follow this presentation and contribute to the conversation by using the hashtag NetEvents, or by following the endowment at NetDemocracy, or by following ISEFI at ISEFI. If you have not already done so, please take a moment to silence your cell phones. And please know that we'll reserve time for a dynamic Q&A session at the end. So please note and save your questions for that time. Finally, let me take this opportunity to thank the staff members involved in organizing this event, especially those on the Latin America and Caribbean team and the Public Affairs Office. So my gratitude is equally proportionate to the number of emails or phone calls that you received. So without further ado, Ricardo, I'll turn it over to you. Good afternoon to all. To all. Thank you very much, uh, Janelle. I want to deeply express our gratitude to uh, the National Endowment for Democracy for hosting uh, this event and this presentation here in Washington, D.C. today. And I am very grateful, too, to Juan Pablo Guerrero and the Global Initiative for, for Fiscal Transparency to offering his um, um, siempre valiosos comentarios, Juan Pablo. So. Now, uh, going to, uh, directly to the presentation, um, I'm going to divide it in five uh, sections. 
And first, allow me to refer uh, for the uh, motivation on this work of, of the book. Allow me to say that uh, it looked like um, corruption is kind of fashionable uh, 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 in Central America, but it is not. It is a shame that uh, we are devoting so much work and so much uh, attention to this uh, social cancer that is eroding our societies. And as Janelle pointed out, we are very, very aware that it is not only Central America, but it's around the world. But um, the problem in the Central American Northern Triangle uh, we or maybe our first uh, finding is that it's an is a structural problem, and as such at that uh, magnitude, it demands structural solutions. Integral reform seeking fiscal justice in the region face opposition and resistance due to corruption. Fight against corruption is a premise for any democratic development agenda in the region. And, I, and we believe that this is a strong statement that should be taken uh, very much in account. But above all, it's an urgent and legitimate citizen demand. So this is our main uh, motivation. We at ISEFI look forward for uh, uh, fiscal justice reforms in Central America. We look forward for democratic development in the region, but corruption clearly is hampering that uh, uh, efforts. So uh, we start in our book, uh, in our fixed first chapter, to establish a relationship between corruption and democracy and uh, how corruption uh, is, is um, uh, working in uh, the context of weak democracies. So we see a vicious circle of political corruption and impunity, a gap between speech and reality of the reform for, for, of the reforms from transparency and the corruption and impunity. Reforms affect privileges of, let's say, very powerful actors in the region. Corruption shows serious unbalances among power share distribution, democracy malfunction. Talking about corruption is talking about power and power unbalanced. <coughs> Institutional efforts to investigate and sanction the answer for social demands against corruption. Not only the public sector, but one Oh, may, may I say the second main find, finding in this book is that this is not a problem only for the government or within the government. Private sector has a very important responsibility in dealing with corruption. So on the third part of this book, we try to identify the main paths leading to corruption in the Northern Triangle of Central America and we found eight main paths. The first is legislation, outdated legislation. A legislation in the three countries that allows high level of corruption, it is many times anachronistic or just a collection of patch laws, lack of anti-corruption international standards, and uh, you may find in the book a lot uh, um, a list of the of the special laws, especially the civil service laws, the public procurement legislation, so on and so forth, the, 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 the budget legislation. The second one is weak institutionality, weak institutions. The, we have identified with great concern the supreme audit entities and governmental internal audit perceived with poor performance. The prosecution against corruption uh, offices has been strengthened, but maybe is not enough. The executive branch uh, at, the, uh, at the three countries have tried to establish specialized offices for transparency, but in the majority of cases they have failed within the executive branch. Three, justice administration systems with limited capabilities and resources. 
the judiciary and prosecutor offices have been strengthened uh, in the region with new legislation, with streamlined or improved investigation and procedural action, but still lack capabilities, budget, independence, territorial covering, infrastructure, and updated legal framework to meet challenges. Just to put a quick example, the Public Prosecutor Office, the Ministerio Público in Guatemala, has only 34 offices uh, in 340 municipalities, a coverage of only 10% of the whole uh, total territory of Guatemala. Just to put an example. The criminal or political economic networks are more adaptable, more agile, and let's see, sadly, more powerful than the justice administration system. The justice administration system most follow the um, rule of law, the respect of human rights, and all these uh, procedures that are constitutional, but the criminal networks are freehand to adapt, and they do quite rather quickly. Four, very important for this relationship between corruption and democracy. The electoral and political party systems lacks democratic rigor. Weak oversight over political parties financing, the campaign financing, it's a huge problem when one wants, uh, wants to, uh, to deal with corruption. Allow monies to create distortions and generate wide spectrum of risks. Other variables uh, very important with this relationship between electoral and political parties systems with corruption are private sector elites as electoral financers, as the main source of money for campaign. Media and indirect political financing is a big problem in Central America. We have these caciques of the t local TV and local radio that are in charge of uh, the um, um, propaganda during electoral year. Corruption frameworks and politic, um, um, uh, um, around public works is a huge problem and the relation between organized crime and politics financing. And public works are important because in our previous book, the so-called ISEFIS Red Book, we have a chapter that um, studied the link between uh, the construction sector and corruption and political financing in a whole system of power uh, uh, on balance sharing. Then, poor access to public information. Uh, we have taken steps forward to uh, pass legislation to, to, uh, to recognize the right to uh, access public information, but oversight bodies that uh, are in charge of uh, the respect of this right face barriers, in particular budget and senior officials' appointment. Prevailing secrecy, so-called culture, and lack of political will for public information access, law compliance, and this is particularly severe in Honduras when they have the public information law, but they have also the secrecy law at the same time simultaneously. So this poor access to public information certainly hampers citizen participation, which is the sixth path to corruption in the region. Norms with emphasis in participation are found at local level with scarce effectiveness, especially in at local government where the rule of law is so weak in the three countries. Support for other spaces with diverse results, the gap between norms and exercise of regulated particip participative mechanism, poor sustainability of efforts, changes of government, the political cycle doesn't, don't, don't offer, doesn't offer guarantees to sustain uh, uh, these spaces for citizen participation. Social disengagement due to limited results, the scarce binding effect, and other two final things with this um, very challenging issue of citizen participation. Citizen apathy, distrust, and this interest on what happens in the public sector. It is a social problem in uh, the three countries. And a very, very complex one, the citizen pragmatism or the survival sense of people. Let them still 
but do work. Let's get to the medical attention, but if the, if the bribe is reasonable. This problem is a huge one and deserves more deep study and comprehension. Seven, the issue of conflicts of interest linked co to, to corruption acts, traffic of influences, bribery, or authority abuse. Weakness in prevention, detection, and sac sanction mechanisms in the OECD context, gaps in legislation lead to the revolving door phenomenon and damage all these damaging citizen trust in legitimacy of public decisions and in the decision takers. Uh, uh, given trust to this vicious circle of public par lack of public participation, but lack of interest. So the conflict of interest, sometimes very, very open spoken in our countries. And eight, a very important one, impunity. I have called impunity the most profitable business in, uh, in these countries. The possibility to sell uh, this situation that you can break, you can violate the law without receiving punishment. So this is a very lucrative business, a product maybe of history and structural, economic, political, cultural and social conditions in the region. Societies with incomplete transitions from authoritarian to democratic regimes. Don't forget that um, Central America was part of the most intense and heated low intensity conflicts within the context of the Cold War. Corruption and organized crime, national and transnational, have a substantial presence and influence in the region. More evident answers are the special ed prosecutor offices, being the Guatemalan case a very interesting experiment with a mix of a national specialized institution within the public prosecutor office, the Fiscalía Especial contra la Impunidad, the special office against impunity, supported by an UN-based commission against impunity, CICIG, for those of you that follow uh, newspapers of Guatemala, know that CICIG is a very important part of the equation. And you know what? That mix of national, international institutionality is working in Guatemala. So this is why we understand the president and the mayor of the city of Guatemala are so interested to expel the UN commissioner, Ivan Velasquez. Then you have the Salvadorian case that have rejected this mix of, of uh, national, international uh, entities, and they have within the public prosecutor office the special group against impunity. And then we have the case of Honduras that are setting up a um, structure similar to the Guatemalan case with a special OES uh, a mission against impunity, but with lesser uh, powers compared to CC in the Guatemalan case. So that are the eight paths to corruption the, that we have identified. In the fourth part, I want to talk about the costs uh, of corruption. And we have, of course, at ISEFI, some public finance bias, and we are uh, inclined to talk of public finance and budget, but we are not trying to calculate the exact amount of corruption, because simply that is impossible. Uh, there is no official statistics and data for corruption. So, the thing that the uh, ISEFI uh, have done in this book is to grab the relevant cases, those cases that are documented in um, court, in the public prosecutor office, and in serious uh, uh, um, media and journalistic investigations. So for the case of Honduras, the relevant cases analyzed are for the period coming from 20, uh, 2007 and 2014. There are eight years of cases in Honduras. By their relevance, the analyzed cases are grouped in four general categories. Corruption in public procurement, of course. That 
I think everybody was expecting that one. Fraud in the Honduran Social Security Institute, corruption cases in the Health Secretariat, and emergency decrees, and splitting of public procurement operations. Corruption in social services delivery, corruptions in, in public works contracting, and abuse of public trust funds. That will be the four main categories of the relevant cases analyzed for Honduras. And in this chart, I am not going into details, all the details is, are in the book, but you can um, uh, find in the book some kind of systematization of the most relevant cases, taking in account the category, the entity affected, the description, and the period of each case. Taking all this information and all the investigations, what we try to do is to identify the amount of resources lost not by the whole corruption problem in Honduras, just the amounts that the public prosecutor office, that courts and serious um, uh, journalistic investigation have identified. And you know, the, the amount is not that relevant, but what we did is just to give an idea of how big, how serious, how um, serious is, is, the, is the wound for the Honduran society. So the estimated corruption of this only, only for these relevant cases is five times the size of the development and social inclusion budget in the government. Is two and a, and a fourth times the infrastructure and public services secretariat budget of Honduras. It is twice the security secretariat budget in a country, in a society that is being hurted so much by domestic violence, by, by, by the so-called um, organized or normal crime. It is 70% of health secretariat budget and is 35% of education secretariat budget in Honduras. So these, of course, are not accurate statistics. They are not precise calculation. But even if you put in some uh, question about the precision of the calculation, it gives a clear idea of the size of the, of the, of the damage that corruption does in Honduras. Now, for the relevant cases in El Salvador, following, uh, following uh, more or less the same methodology, uh, it, it dates back from 1989 to 2017, and by their relevance, the cases are grouped in four general categories. Again, and this again is underlined, public procurement, public works contracting, other public procurement, including medicine and medic and hospital supplies, the health sector again. Corruption in human resources, hiring, and the so-called ghost posting problem, that a figure of pumping money from one public sector posting and the, where nobody is working really. Embellishment and other fraud forms in the budget execution, especially in parallel mechanisms like, again, public trust funds. Negligence and obstruction to investigation and sanction procedures for corruption acts. So in the case of El Salvador, the details of the relevant cases are abundant and uh, you can find public works on almost these, uh, all these are uh, uh, problems and you have the public works ministry, the um, uh, health minister, uh, the social security institute uh, and then uh, public works, goods and services procurement, the ghost posting problem in the Reg Registry National Center, the Social Security Institute, public trust funds, and other schemes, including financial sector corruption. So the analysis of all these uh, uh, cases reveals that the estimated corruption linked to these particular relevant cases, this is, again, I must stress this is not total corruption, but only the, the documented cases, uh, the, the figures are, com are coming from the documented cases. 
It is 6.6 times the public prosecutor office budget. So this is an unfair uh, battle. Let's say, for example, this is the budget for the relevant corruptions, high profile cases. So it is almost seven times the budget from the prosecutor office, the people who is in charge to fight corruption. So the corrupt people have more money, far more money. It is one and a four times the justice and public security category budget, again, in a country like El Salvador with problems with gangs and maras. It's 94% of the health category budget, 60% of education category budget. So again, this is not the total amount of loss of corruption. But at least we can be, in a way, sure that this loss really happened in El Salvador. And it is almost the size of the health uh, uh, um, budget. So it's a great loss. And again, in Guatemala, uh, cases uh, analyzed are only those from CICIG time, very short period of time, 2008 and 2017, because before of that, scarce information is available. Uh, this includes very important new category in, in the Guatemalan case, institutions capture, the control of the state institutions for corruption purposes. Customs and tax fraud cases. And this is very important because in a, in a workshop that we have in the previous day at GIFT, the tax side is very important. And in the Guatemalan case, it's raising that it is not only a problem at the expenditure side, it is only a problem in the tax, in the income, uh, in the revenue side. Administrative corruption cases traffic of influences, illicit enrichment, and again, goes post. Of course, public procurement, cases affecting the right to health. In a country that half of children suffers a, some kind of chronic malnutrition, again, this is a crime. Judicial corruption cases, corruption in judges, those that are in charge to rule uh, or, or to issue the sentences in, in, in uh, corruption cases and corruption and municipal level cases. So what we found is that in the Guatemalan uh, uh, relevant cases, there are no figures. Even CICIG has been unable to determine how much money is Guatemala losing. So we at ISEFI designed this fancy uh, uh, assumption, uh, economist, uh, economist like uh, mechanism to have an idea. So we identify the most risky, the most vulnerable lines in budget and there try to, to make the, the same comparison. So using that kind of methodology, we uh, found that in one year, in one fiscal year, using 2015 budget uh, figures, corruption will be four times the public prosecutor office budget, 92% of the Ministry of the Interior budget, and 74% of the Ministry of Public Health and Social Assistance budget. So, trying to set some differences and similar similarities across the three countries of the, of the no, so-called Northern Triangle, uh, common vulnerable areas are, sadly, health sector. Public works, the so-called ghost post, public procurement as a whole, and public trust funds and parallel mechanisms. Interestingly enough, those voices that in Guatemala are against the CC work usually uh, fail in one of these categories or one of these interests. No, uh, no confusion about that. Um, the other thing that our research found is that there are differences. For example, uh, in the kind of public sector level that corruption is more acute. For example, in the case of Honduras, uh, we found that corruption seems to be more acute in central government, line ministries. The, so, the Social Security Institute. Uh, by contrast, in El Salvador, 
or research uh, suggest that corruption is more acute in government in, in local government municipalities and uh, this is quite interesting because even the, uh, we made a, a whole set of interviews in each of the three countries and perception is corruption is lower at in line ministries and very high in local governments and in the case of Guatemala uh, the perception is that it is acute in all government levels. There is no difference between corruption in Guatemala City uh, uh, municipality or in the Ministry of Public Health or in the Social uh, Security Institute. So the global cost of relevant corruption cases only from the relevant cases, again, in Honduras is huge. It amounts more or less 4.3% of the gross domestic product, and is particularly severe in um, uh, the cost of, um, uh, of corruption in the, on, uh, institute, the Secular, um, Social Security Institute of Honduras, representing more than 95% of the relevant corruption cases. So the huge one in Honduras is the Social Security Institute plunder. In the case of El Salvador, it is very, very big, 2.1% of GDP, uh, severe in public wars, a third of, the, of that cost. And you know what? The so-called secret presidential appropriation item in, in the, the la, la Cuenta pre, Secreta Presidencial around half of the total cost of the uh, relevant cases analyzed. So the lack of transparency, of fiscal transparency in the budget is an important caveat that leads to corruption. If we keep these secret items in the budget, the Salvadorian cases is a hard lesson to learn that that secret items in budget uh, in these particular cases amounts for half of the corruption losses uh, that had been documented by the Public Prosecutor Office and other cases. In the Guatemala, following the methodology, in just one year, one year, corruption amounts for 0.8% of GDP, assuming a 20% loss due to corruption in vulnerable items. So, to finish, we launch ourselves into the emptiness of uh, a risky business to uh, make proposals. So, eight guidelines to advance in an anti-corruption agenda in the Northern Triangle of Central America. First, national policies or coordination spaces for transparency, fight against corruption, and open government should be at most in all countries. Secondly, fiscal policy is an important part of the anti-corruption effort, of any anti-legitimate anti-corruption effort, fiscal transparency. For transparency, which effectively achieves the efficient and transparent use of public resources. Three, assure public officials and workers probity and accountability and open government culture within the government within the state. Especially things like the asset declarations of high officials should be made public. And there are a whole set of reforms that should be taken in account. Four, warranty public information access, including open data and personal data and protection policies. It's not only to have the law enforce that legislation and compliance is important and sanction when the law is not is violated. Five. Facilitate citizen participation through collaboration spaces between government and civil society. Sixth, introduce the analysis of the private sector responsibility in the corruption fighting efforts. I think now it's clear, it's almost a consensus that corruption is not a problem only for the government, the public sector. Fortunately enough, for example, in Guatemala and the other countries, private sector organizations are recognizing their challenges in this, uh, in this um, part. Seventh, recognize and 
face the, the relationship between corruption and electoral and political systems. Remember, corruption is a serious impediment to democratic development, to any develop, democratic development agenda. So this relationship between electoral system as the operational framework for any demo, democracy should, it should be identified and aid. A structural reform of the justice administration system, including capabilities to fight against corruption. This is why in Guatemala, one of the main points of the CCIG agenda is to reform the whole judiciary uh, system. In the book, you will find for each objective and country proposal for legislative and institutional strengthening actions. So the book is, uh, can be downloaded for free in our website. We invite you to read it to criticize it, and I just uh, want to thank you for your attention and presence here today. And again, thank you very much for Ned and Juan Pablo. You are welcome with your critics, comments, and suggestions. Thank you very much. Ricardo, for your is this on? a moment, we'll wait. Thank you very much for your uh, excellent uh, analysis and for laying out these pathways of corruption and also uh, really critically the the agenda for combating it. I think for a lot of us in the audience and a lot of us who work with civil society in the region, that is going to be a really critical component of the work that we can use in our thinking about corruption in the region. Uh, for now, we'll turn to Juan Pablo Guerrero for his expert commentary for a few minutes before we engage you all in a Q&A. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, Ricardo. Uh, it's uh, a real pleasure to be part of the discussion today. I'm so glad you thought not only of uh, the fiscal, uh, the global, the global initiative for fiscal transparency to be part of um, a perspective, uh, a critical perspective of, of your book, but personally, that you thought of me being part of uh, this wonderful opportunity to share uh, this very important book with uh, all of you. Thank you uh, to uh, the National Endowment for Democracy, Janelle, for the hospitality. Uh, I was um, quite um, amazed by the amount of uh, information and the strength of the analytical framework that you used to address uh, the very complex issue of corruption in these three countries. Uh, one very obvious striking feature of this book is uh, the methodological rigor. Uh, it uh, can also be uh, visited as a, a practical handbook on how to study corruption. Uh, uh, and uh, this is not an easy task. And it has become more and more complex as uh, um, societies evolved and they get also uh, more uh, plural and uh, 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 variadas. Uh, so I uh, uh, would recommend any uh, one who studies corruption to uh, follow uh, your methodology for uh, the uh, analysis of the phenomenon in any place of, of the world. And while reading it, uh, I was uh, thinking about my own country, Mexico, and uh, its uh, own struggles against corruption. Brazil uh, today uh, with the same uh, challenges, uh, Argentina. And uh, I could uh, look at uh, the 
uh, strengths and pitfalls of their struggles while uh, uh, specifically uh, learning more about Guatemala, uh, El Salvador, Honduras in, in your book. So the first point is uh, uh, that uh, uh, corruption is a universal phenomenon and we have here a very strong tool to better uh, analyze it and understand it. Um, very much uh, related to this, it is a comprehensive approach. It looks at every aspect and at every stakeholder. Uh, you emphasize the private sector, but uh, you also take into consideration organized crime, financial systems, the political electoral system, of course, the one we know more a little bit about, the administrative uh, uh, systems of, of corruption. But uh, uh, to take all of that into account uh, and from a comparative perspective, looking at three countries uh, gives uh, a, 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 um, an enlightenment perspective to your, your findings. So we have a very good, strong, great diagnosis. Therefore, there is an adequate, uh, strong uh, set of uh, prescriptive uh, uh, solutions. Uh, we can see clearly what is failing, why is failing, and you provide very consequent um, solutions on how to fix it. Uh, you just name eight. I won't uh, go through them because I would like, of course, all, all of us to very quickly be part of this discussion. Um, I would just like to uh, point out at um, uh, how important, from my perspective, is uh, to include uh, three less common solutions to address this problem. One is citizen engagement and participation. It is uh, impossible to address uh, institutional fixing without taking into account the environment, and that includes, of course, the citizens, the, the beneficiaries of public service or the users of, of these public services as a very important element. The inclusion of the private sector that you emphasize quite uh, strongly and, and, of course, the need of an independent and judiciary uh, branch. Uh, now, you elaborate quite significantly on the cost, uh, the economic cost uh, of, of, of corruption, and uh, one could also uh, think about uh, the social and uh, political cost uh, uh, the impact on trust, among other things, uh, and how it uh, fragments and divides our, our societies. Uh, but uh, in spite of uh, all those pieces of, of not good news, I still want to finish with a note of optimism. We, we met, Ricardo, when, when you were in charge of, uh, uh, of the budget in your country and uh, you were advancing the budget transparency agenda strongly. When was this? Can you remind me that? 2010. Well, seven years ago, we would not have dreamed then that thanks to access to information, to a stronger civil society, to a... a if you want awkward, but after all, a, a advancement of your, the, the democratic systems in, this, in these countries, we would be looking at what we've seen lately in, in uh, uh, all of them, and particularly in, in, in Guatemala. I was so um, fortunate to again visiting Ricardo, now in Isefi, uh, to be uh, witnessing the people of Guatemala taking La Plaza and uh, demanding the resignation of the president who was accused by, by corruption. And uh, as, as a Mexican, I was so jealous and I was so proud to be friends of, of the Guatemalans that they could take the streets 
Uh, so you have a much more openness, you have access to information, you have many better systems of, of uh, calling into account, you have investigative journalism, you have a stronger civil society. So basically, I believe you have strong think tanks such as uh, the one uh, you are uh, um, leading with Jonathan Mekons and, and other colleagues. Uh, you have um, a very good base to undertake some of the solutions you uh, um, uh, propose. So the questions to start with is where to begin? Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, they are all there and one can uh, uh, acknowledge and, and uh, well basically be in accord that they are all important, but uh, uh, if you could elaborate uh, on, on when, and of course this is gonna be different in every country, but uh, what would be the method on deciding where to begin? Um, and uh, another aspect, uh, um, the political economy of, of the reform to fight, to fight. Uh, what, what is the role of the elites, the political elites? I am sure, because I've seen this in Mexico, in Brazil, in Argentina, that uh, th they might be very much against some reforms, but they might be very much in favor of others. And how can you form a coalition? Mm. Um, and how could you better resist those who are opposing it? Just a couple of questions to start with. I'm sure the, the public will add to this um, a way to start the conversation. Thank you again. Thank you, Juan Pablo. I think it's really critical as well that you've put the cases we're looking at in Central America in the broader regional context and that we also keep in mind that in the Northern Triangle countries, it, it's more difficult to fight this entrenched corruption with weaker institutions than you might have in, in Brazil or Argentina. And thank you also for taking my first question, uh, the words right out of my mouth. Where do, we, where, where do we start? You've presented a very daunting, very ambitious, very important agenda uh, of eight objectives, but are there, there are some that sequentially should come first or are there are there some that potentially are more feasible in the political context we're seeing right now? So, uh, and then one other question to add there is on the on the issue of citizen engagement. How do for for a couple of priorities um, that you might be able to lay out for us? You know, which ones are the most cru crucial? How does citizen apathy kind of decrease in citizen engagement increase and be channeled to those those priorities? Um, and then we'll. We'll turn it over to the audience. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, when uh, we were thinking about um, making a proposal of uh, an agenda. Is your mic on? Yeah, on. Is it on? It's yeah. It is, yeah. Maybe the, the volume. <laughs> the volume, yeah. Um, when I, I was saying that when we were thinking about setting an agenda, um, it was kind of, um, our main concern was to not to be naive in, in, in setting this kind of, of proposals. So we at the CEFI, we are well, well aware about the challenges of, of implementing such an agenda. Challenges from the point of view of politics and uh, some technical ch uh, challenges. For example, in public procurement, okay, everybody is talking about uh, a, a, a full overhaul of, of the public procurement system, but following with which model? Following with which kind of rules and, 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 and frameworks? So uh, there is no perfect model for public procurement in the whole world. Last week I was in, in Stockholm and uh, listened to the, listening to the uh, 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 problems in public procurement in Sweden, I was amazed that it's not that different than the public procurement problems in Guatemala. So there is no, no receipt for that. So there are serious uh, technical challenges and political challenges. So we try not to be naive. So um, of course there is uh, <coughs> resistance from the political and economical elites to uh, um, try one of these um, structural reforms. I'm going to quote Mr. Ivan Velasquez's uh, uh, statement during the interview for this research. And he said that 
Ministerio Público, the Public Prosecutor Office, and CICIG have been very successful on putting relevant cases, high-level cases, but they have failed in putting together one sole structural reform in Guatemala. So the thing is that uh, to set uh, uh, priorities within this agenda of eight areas, um, all of them have characteristic, uh, structural characteristics, and it's not easy to, to, to start a structural reform. CICIG and Ministerio Público have demonstrated that it is possible to set uh, relevant cases with high impact cases, but no structural reform yet. So a lot of discussion has been going on on, on, on what will be the priority within these eight uh, lines of, of, a, of a main agenda. There could be more even <coughs> or less. But um, following Mr. Velasquez's thoughts, maybe we can keep going to obtain high impact relevant cases. But I think the first relevant structural reform in order to start a real uh, 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 sustainable effort against corruption will be the electoral system. The rules, the transparency, the anti-corruption measures on the mechanisms of uh, renewing authorities in the three branches uh, of, of the state. So I will say in the three countries, uh, the structural reform of the electoral system will be the first, which is right in the middle of the problem. And uh, uh, the, the three of them, the three countries, you would say that? In the three countries. And, and I'm going to say that Guatemala has a very serious problem with political parties. But I think, and maybe I'm wrong, but I will say that the country which is facing the most serious challenges in uh, this link between corruption and electoral system, uh, system will be Honduras. Uh, and, and in my personal opinion, one very important example of that is that in Honduras, a court ruled that the constitution was inconstitutional for the re-election matter of Juan Orlando, the President Juan Orlando Hernandez. So this can give us an example of how serious it is that even uh, a court issued this opinion, that the Constitution was inconstitutional. So in the three countries are serious problems, but I will say that in Honduras the, is, is a serious, very serious challenge. And then after the electoral system, I will go for uh, the judiciary. The judiciary complete overhaul. And then maybe uh, I will go for a third priority on the structural reforms linked with the fiscal system, public procurement, budget, and, 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 other, on, and other parts of the, of the, of the fiscal system. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's, um, given the time, let's turn to the audience for some questions and we can also incorporate uh, a discussion on, on citizen engagement uh, into your responses. Let's start with, with Mark here. Um, yeah. Mark Schneider, uh, CSIS. Muchas um, gracias. Uh, it was a great presentation. It's a great report. I urge everyone to read it. Um, I'm curious, though, you cite in Guatemala the citizen apathy as one of the obstacles. Mm -hmm. And yet, if one thinks back to the citizen participation in protests that resulted in, essentially resulted in, in the uh, decision uh, for the resignation of one president and, and currently forced, really forced the uh, legislation that was uh, unacceptable to be reversed. Um, I'm curious why, what's the nature of the citizen apathy in Guatemala? And 
Um, what's lacking to ensure, in a sense, a sustained citizen participation movement, uh, particularly in the other two countries? Um, and, and finally, one other little point. You said that it was in Guatemala, that, that you didn't find the problem with tax um, corruption in the tax system that you have in Guatemala with the uh, La Linea, et cetera, that you didn't find the problem of tax evasion a major problem in the other two countries? Let's take one or two more questions yeah. in a round. Um, head towards the, yeah, show the gentleman in the back. Uh, my name is Marcelo de Jesus. I'm from Argentina. Very interesting book. Seems very comprehensive. Uh, I had only the chance to see, to read the executive summary. But I'm curious about the wording. No? It says legislation uh, not updated. It says uh, obstacles uh, for the judicial system. Uh, limited cap uh, capacity for, for the judicial system. You have legislation on public information, uh, weak institutionality. But it seems that all these words refer not having honest people in these institutions. Because uh, all these countries have ratified conventions against corruption, has uh, all they have uh, laws for public information, they all have a democratic system. So in the end, uh, what these countries need is honest people in the right position. So this is my understanding of what I'm reading. If it is true, how do you put the right people in the right positions to make those institutions work? Mm -hmm. And uh, right here. Uh, hi, I'm Ursula Indacocha from the Due Process of Law Foundation. Congratulations for the report. And uh, well, my question goes um, to the topic of the agenda, the eight points of the agenda. Um, I've heard you, and I think it's uh, it's a very uh, good uh, selections of points. But I, I have a feeling that. Maybe this agenda could not be only addressed at the national level, and, it, and, and that the Northern Triangle has a major problem of corruption that has penetrated the, the political system itself. So maybe, I, and I want in this your opinion, I would like to hear you. Um, what do you think uh, that it's needed to engage the international community on this? Uh, how can the um, international bodies like United Nations or, or maybe the OAS, uh, could be more engaged on being the muscle to, to push for, for this uh, agenda at, at the national and, and to share it with the international level. Great, thanks. So we'll take those questions on sustaining citizen engagement, yeah. the tax question, how do you get honest people to function in, in potentially dishonest systems? Uh, and then the question on engaging the international community. Well, um, I will say that it looked like that public participation in Guatemala is, is, is in a transformation path. It's evolving. And apathy is, is um, more and more a smaller problem. Uh, and, and people' interest and awareness is uh, growing just because one reason. They have proved that the system, even when uh, uh, non-to-date legislation, can work. It's a question of the right people doing the right thing. I will say that public apathy is more serious in El Salvador. With uh, trust and credibility of the system, it's, it's at stake. But in Guatemala, having said that, but in Guatemala, there is a still a huge problem, which is the pragmatism issue that I try to raise. That people, for example, OK, this issue of anti-corruption it's fine, but the roads are in bad shape. 
because almost all contracts of public works in roads had been challenged in court. So while the investigations are taking place, works are stopped. So I don't give uh, too much interest for the prosecutor. I want my roads because I want my car not to be destroyed at, uh, at the roads. So I would say in Guatemala, pragmatism is uh, a huge menace to, to the, to the anti-corruption effort. Mm. There is, in the book, there is no cases of tax corruption or customs or tax administration because there are no cases. So there are no documented cases. So this is why the number of categories that we are, we are showing in the case of Guatemala are seven, and in the other countries it's only four, because there have, ni there have no big cases, we hope, yet. But of course there is corruption there. Um, the issue of systems, uh, laws, and institutions, and people. Uh, I mean, um, you can have fully honest people doing the right thing even with not too good l laws or not too good legislation. But if, um, uh, if you put one of the uh, Central American uh, corrupt guys working in Sweden, chances are that when he or she tries to do his or her thing, the system is going to, uh, to, to whistle and, 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 and do so. Systems are important because, for example, if uh, the asset declaration is secret and nobody can measure or the tax authority has no access to bank information, because uh, the constitution or the law forbids it, so it's more difficult to do it. But having said that, uh, you are right. At the end, people, humans, are over system, laws, and institutions. So that is why I think the first priority is for electoral and political party system, the mechanism that uh, so-called democracy or a democracy in development uh, uses to select the people who is going to uh, take decisions and, his, uh, and is going to, to rule. So um, the democratic development is important in order to choose uh, the right people. And representation or participation systems, the parliament, and the, that, that is why we raised the very important link between electoral systems corruption and, um, and the whole thing. And for the agenda, um, CICIG, the uh, UN Commission Against Impunity in Guatemala, I think it's an outstanding uh, example of how the international community action can uh, link with the national action against corruption and impunity. Um, it has worked. Uh, even taking uh, Mr. Velasquez, the commissioner words, that only for mo the moment with high impact relevant cases and no structural reform, but at least Guatemala has been in the front pages because all interest and results against corruption. So the, the example is clear and the golden world is independence. The opportunity that the international community has to join, to support a national effort against corruption is because it is going to be independent from government, from political parties, from private sector, and so on and so forth. CICIG is an example of success. I'm, I defend that idea. Uh, but uh, it has its risk, of course, and I think um, this international community effort uh, success should be complemented by structural reform and national entities strengthening. Thank you. And Juan Pablo, if you'd like to add. Well, if, if you allow me with my good friend Ricardo to be, as we usually are a little bit provo provocative. Yeah. On 
on the prescription priorities, it seems to me that going first to the electoral system and then the judiciary reform would encounter tremendous resistance in the political elite and, uh, and the political and economical and administrative, basically in the elite of these countries. Uh, I understand that uh, if you could have uh, uh, the magic, how do you say, varita magica? Mm, magic, a magic wand. Yes, you could start with that. But but um, what 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 I I what I like of having eight proposals is that it, it allows you to look at opportunities, political opportunities, and eventually try to go further on access to information or start with. A, a better fiscal transparency, uh, and uh, the 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 question to you is uh, again, uh, where do you see pos possible coalitions, including the elites, mm -hmm. to start on any of these fronts? And there, I would think that it would change from country, and it would change from political circumstance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's let's mull that over while we get another round yeah. of, of questions. Um, I think Jorge there in the in the back had a question. Good morning. Uh, I'm Jorge Enriquez from Social Forum of External Debt of Honduras. I want to congratulate Ricardo, Juan Pablo, and Janelle through the net to host this event. I have a short comment before. Uh, I said that corruption is a hurricane affecting our region for many years and we are now uh, dealing with it. The government uh, says that we have a good accomplishments and results, but at the end, uh, the poverty in our cases are remain for many years, and so that uh, doesn't have any effects. And the question is for you or for any of the audience, how is being seen by international or national uh, institutions, the role of civil society to the Maxi and Sisik in Guatemala. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Claudia Escobar. I've been a judge in Guatemala for many years. And I want to congratulate you for, for this research. I think it's very, very well done and needed. But there is one aspect that cannot be measured and that you haven't talked about, and it's fear. The fear that people have you know, to denounce, the fear of the judges, of the prosecutors that are you know, in the institutions and they, they want to fight corruption, but they can, can be threat. And I think that's what we are seeing in Guatemala right now because all these um, investigations that the CIC has done, um, the other people that are behind that is organized crime, and they're not just going to wait <laughs> for them to be punished. So what can you say about that? And then maybe we'll take, I think there were two, if you could be extremely brief. Thank you. Actually, you almost <laughs> said what I was going to ask. Um, but um, fa thank you very much. This is Stephanie Burgos with Oxfam. And um, uh, it was a great analysis. I haven't had a chance to read the book yet. But I was curious if you uh, talk about the illicit networks or the illegal economy actors and and um, the role that they play. And, and then also um, six, a certain amount of success, particularly in Guatemala, seems to have a, a reaction in terms of um, of, of repression and and the um, the concerns that that uh, civil society in particular is is having to face, and so if you could um, speak a little bit to to how you think that needs to be addressed, thank you. And then there was one final. I think you had a final question. Uh, congratulations, Ricardo. Very very good study. I haven't read it yet, but it looks very impressive, and I'm sure it will be as impressive as the rest of work of ISEFI. I'm Mary Speck. I'm an independent consultant right now in, in Washington, but I lived in, in Guatemala. I wondered if you could do, I have an admittedly speculative question, but I wonder if you could make a balance of Sisik, since you said that Ivan Velasquez himself says we haven't made the structural reforms necessary, and sort of following up on the last two questions about the issue of organized crime and the issues of fear, um, how much has really changed um, in Guatemala? Obviously, the, uh, ex the uh, resignation of, 
of Pérez Molina was an extraordinary event and, and people can identify and get excited about kicking out a president. It's a little bit more difficult to organize people about around the mundane, everyday corruption that, as you pointed out, they're used to and is practical. It gets things done. Um, so how much has Guatemala really changed? Is everything go back to normal after Sisik leaves? What, what's your opinion on that? So let's take just the remaining two or three minutes to tackle these big questions. I'll leave yeah. that to you. Maybe I'm going to, to, to speak like an old-fashioned telegram in a small piece of paper. <laughs> well, um, maybe, maybe I was, I, I didn't state it uh, uh, clear enough. Uh, of course, I was talking about an, uh, a structural reform oh. agenda. Uh, going to the right of the of the of the mill uh, 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 at the center of it, but that doesn't mean that you can go for targets of opportunity. So I will say that fiscal transparency, uh, 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 public information access, uh, the laws have been there, the institutions are already there. So I will say that not classified as a structural reform. So you can do it right now. And, and we are trying to do it, and, uh, and we have been, for example, with the Ministry of Public Finance, we have been taking some steps forward. But again, uh, they are not of a structural scale, I will say. So uh, that should not stop at all. Uh, we are not going to stop these targets of opportunity waiting for the big reform. And not being naive, but I think the current uh, crisis in Guatemala is opening up the opportunity for a structural reform in the electoral system. I don't know if in Honduras, uh, this uh, scandal of the re-election, the, the constitutionality of the constitution, uh, will, it, it, it has the potential. So I think structural reforms very often are the result of a crisis. Mm -hmm. And you cannot live in a constant crisis, but I think uh, you have to, if the crisis arises and you have eight options, you uh, in advance should know what is going to be the first. So when we are at the table in the, in the current, uh, in the ongoing crisis, many people are demanding reform of the constitution and, uh, and the consensus. Let's pick just one structural reform if the moment, if the window of, of opportunity opens. And they that one was electoral reform. Just, just to clarify, and, and you are totally right about that. Claudia Escobar, it's a great honor to meet you personally. Uh, we all Guatemalans uh, recognize you, and your question is kind of interesting because you ask about fear, and, and I think you personally embodies what no fear is about. <laughs> what uh, uh, um, courage is about. So uh, my respect to you, really, my respect and admiration for you, yes. And um, I will say in Guatemala, strange, strange things are happening. For example, the young students at La Plaza, those girls and boys of 19, 20, 20 years old, they, ha they don't have fear in their minds. I still remember when I was 18, many years ago, <laughs> uh, the, 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 the peace accords have not seen a sign yet in Guatemala, and I had fear to go to the demonstration. And my father and my mother was, were in panic because uh, they, when they realized that I was participating in a, in a public demonstration, I think most young citizens don't, don't have fear. So you are absolutely right. Fear, maybe, panic is going on on people who can be affected by the anti-corruption effort. And then you have this story that I totally uh, not uh, agree and don't believe of the, of the government has stopped because of the fear of being accused of corruption if you sign a contract. That is completely not true. Maybe if you don't have any idea or any clue of what to do 
you are not you are not trained properly in order to do a public procurement operation. You have fear. I can understand that. But then you have to look for training. Or if your business is to make uh, a constant fraud for public procurement, then you should be afraid of, of, of the situation. So fear is a very, very complex thing to understand in Guatemala. I am convinced, for example, the private sector in Guatemala reacts every time due to fear. Fear to instability, fear of macroeconomic thing, fear of public demonstration. So I don't have a complete answer for you because it's a very, very complex. I invite psychologists, psychologist, uh, historians, maybe philosophers to try to understand the phenomenon of fear in Guatemala in a post-war society. Um, I, um, the, the evaluation uh, of CICIG, Mary. Uh, again, quoting Mr. Velázquez uh, in his uh, interview, what CICIG has achieved is pushing Guatemala to a breaking point, a point of no return. And that could be failure. And that could be uh, uh, disaster. That the corruption forces can still win the battle. But in 2015, we witnessed a starting point of a whole process. So it doesn't matter too much if the structural reform happened back in 2015. It was a start, an awakening. But now, in, two, in 2017, there is no return. There is no possible um, sharing of CICIG and a mayor that had been corrupt for 40 years. That is inconsistent. And conflict could be a result of that. So the result is the necessary breaking point. Are Guatemalans going to decide to say no more tolerance to corruption, or is pragmatism going to win? So I think that is the value. And El Salvador and Honduras have not reached that breaking po point. Uh, uh, let's say at least yet, but, but uh, I will say that. Juan Pablo, is there a final comment you'd like to add? 